Hello, hi, hello, hi everyone. Good evening, welcome. Welcome to all of you who are here with us today. Welcome also to everyone joining us digitally from around the world. Um, in true kind of pre-post-COVID spirit, this is a bit of a hybrid event. So it's part digital, part live. Patrice was supposed to join us today, um, but because of COVID flight restrictions out of our control, she couldn't. However, we've made it happen. Patrice will be joining us via um, stream. My name is Crystal Mahay Morgan. I'm from Own It, a storytelling lifestyle brand. Um, we're a book publishers, a literary film and TV agency, and we're lucky enough to be publishing Patrice's latest book. Um, it's the follow-up to a Sunday Times bestseller, When They Call You a Terrorist. This book, An Abolitionist Handbook, is really thinking about what next. What happens after the world is where it is today? A lot of you might know Patrice as co-founder of Black Lives Matter, um, former um, executive director of the Global Network. Um, Patrice actually has been an activist, an organiser, someone who's championed humanity and tried to make the world a better place for long before 2020, long before Black Lives Matter started. It's something that's ingrained in her that she's been doing for the last 20 plus years. And an abolitionist handbook is a really exciting moment in terms of where we are and in terms of her as a thinker. It's about how to be a modern day abolitionist and not just what happens when you abolish things that aren't working, but how that opens up opportunities and possibilities for us to reimagine the world in a way where it's more equal and it's inclusive of everyone, obviously including black lives, which at the moment, sometimes the world makes us feel doesn't matter. Um, so I'm really excited. I'm going to hand over. We've got an amazing person leading us in the conversation today, Richie Brave, broadcaster, presenter, most known for being on One Extra um, for One Extra Talk Show, which is a weekly topical show looking at black lives nationwide, the community and the different experiences within them. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to hear from Patrice soon, but please give a warm welcome to Richie Brave. Thank you. I was trying not to trip over the stairs. You know, it goes, that wouldn't be a good start, would it? How are we doing with Patrice? Is she ready for us? Patrice! How are you doing? Hi, team. I'm okay. I'm happy to be here, and I'm sorry not to be in person. I This would have been my first trip out of the country since the pandemic, and there were tons of things I didn't know you needed. Um, so I'm grateful I get to be in conversation with you all virtually, but I will be there tomorrow morning and excited to see folks over the next couple of days. Patrice, do you mind if I give you a second intro so people know what time it is and they know who you are? <laughs> yes, is that is it the very long bio that, that you were given? There is, yeah. This, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to let people know who's in the room, you know what I mean? Trying to, trying to get this on and pop in today. Um, so Patrice <laughs> Colors, <laughs> New York Times best-selling author, artist, educator, and abolitionist co-founder and former executive director of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. She's launching a groundbreaking second book, An Abolitionist Handbook, 12 Steps to Changing Yourself and the World, published by Own It. Now, Patrice has been on the front lines of abolitionist organizing for 20 years, and you definitely don't look old enough to be doing that. <laughs> Um, since she began the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013, it has expanded into a global foundation supporting black-led movements in the US, UK, and Canada, and has been nominated for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. Her first book, a memoir, When They Call You a Terrorist, was published in 2018, and Time 100 also named Patrice as one of the most influential, most influential people in 2020. Now, how about that for an intro? Intro. Yeah, it's very humbling. Thank you, team. Thank you. We were waiting for that. I was definitely waiting for that. And what I do want to say as well is we will have an opportunity to do questions and answers a bit later on. So welcome to you inside the room. Welcome to you at home. But people haven't come here to hear me talk, Patrice. They've come here to hear you talk. 
So I just want to dive into the first question. And I guess it's about abolition more generally. And I feel like this conversation is so sensationalized in the media. There are lots of people throwing their own perspective on what it actually is and skewing the reality. So abolition in its most simplistic terms, talk to me about it and what it is. Sure. Um, abolition is simply the getting rid of the police, the prison state, surveillance, detention centers, court systems. That is the very simple definition of abolition. Uh, but it's important for people to understand that it's more than just that. Um, obviously, as part of my work and many of us as abolitionists, our work has been to challenge the role of police, to challenge the role of incarceration, to challenge the role of the court systems. And um, inside of that, I also believe that we have deeply inherited uh, the ways in which policing and jailing has impacted us personally and interpersonally. So we live in a punishment system. We live in a system that relies on vengeance as a way to hold people accountable. But that's actually not the abolitionist way. And so I also believe that abolition is how we take care of each other, how we are in relationship to one another. And that just brings me on to another follow-on question, actually, because something that stood out in the book for me, and I hear when a lot of people talk about abolition, we talk about process and we talk about systems, but you described abolition as love. And it was one of the, the words you used around abolition. You spoke about love. Can you talk to me a bit about that? Because it's so unusual to hear it described in that way. You know, it's funny that you ask that because... I feel like as a younger abolitionist, as a younger artist, activist, I would read about like some of my favorites, like Che Guevara and Fidel Castro and, you know, um, Angela Davis and um, James Baldwin. And I would love all of their like really fiery work, right? Like all their fiery work. But when they started talking about love, I'd be like, what's that have to do with what we're doing? Like, I really felt like that. I was like, okay, I guess. Like, maybe they're just saying that because they're like trying to you know, relate to whiteness and are like, they're trying to be more palatable. But honestly, as I've gotten older, I'm going to be 39 this year, and I've been in this work since I was 16 years old, I've realized, oh, actually, I now understand why love is such a central part of our work and why abolition is actually an act of love. It's an act of love because when we tell a community that we want to abolish the systems that are consistently harming them, we are also saying, or we are equally saying, we love you so much that we're willing to get rid of a system to build a new one for you, for us. And so absolutely, abolition is at the center of it, love. Love for our people, and I argue love for all of us, because if we're living in a system that continuously cages human beings, that creates harm and violence against human beings, none of us are free. And we can see that as you know, the whole world is witnessing this current war in Ukraine, right? And there's a lot of feelings about, wait a second, y'all, there's a war right now happening in many other countries where people are blacker and browner. Why aren't we worried about them? We, have, we could have this longer conversation about, we, are all, we will all be touched by this carceral system, if we don't stop it, we will all be touched by it. So it is, it's gonna take us collectively to stop imprisonment, to stop the war, to stop all the ways in which the state continues to violate our human and civil rights. And it, what strikes me is your journey. So you spoke about when people were talking about love, your favorites in the beginning, you were like, oh yeah, you're just trying to uphold white supremacy. And that journey that you took to realize that actually love is embedded in our community and what we do as well. And I just, one thing I love about books is hearing the personal journey of, you know, who's ever written it. Um, and I guess that leads me to my next question. So level with me here. And when I did read the book, you were a bit like, yeah, this isn't a book that's going to sit on your shelf. This isn't a book that you're just going to take around and look nice carrying around with you. Um, but why is this book so important? And why the format of a handbook specifically? I wanted to offer something tangible. I wanted to offer um, 
our folks something that they can use on a daily basis, practices that we can do, use. So for example, I'm at the airport yesterday on my way to London thinking like it's gonna be so easy. And I get to the ticket counter, they're asking for things. I show something, they're like, that's not it. You need something else. And I was like, literally, I'm not lying. I'm not gassing myself at all. I literally was like, okay, Patrice Colors, you can be reactive right now and berate <laughs> the tellers, or you can be responsive and think through how you want to deal with this. And I was like, <laughs> I can't actually tell folks to do something and not practice it myself. And so I think, you know, part of this book also was about being held accountable. Like, how do I, how am I holding myself accountable for these things that I so deeply believe in? Um, and then lastly, you know, this book during this time has everything to do with, I believe, the role of social media and misinformation and disinformation and how quickly it is able to proliferate. And we, all of us, are believe in it because... At this point, social media is the truth, you know? And I really believe these tenants are tenants and steps to ask us to slow down, to take our time with information because the role of white supremacy is to confuse us, to tear us apart, and to not have us united. Um, and also, for those of you in the room that don't know or watching at home, this is Patrice Cullors practicing what she preaches. Part of the book is being responsive and not being reactive. So we love that you're living by it because some people just write books and they're like, it's out there now. Like, I've, done, I've done my piece. I ain't living by it. But this is active practicing and we love to see it. Um, Patrice, I, I want to talk about something serious and it's probably close to my heart as a person and what I do and being so community focused and you speak of getting free and being free so you know us getting free in the book as a concept and I feel like it's a subject matter that is very close to a lot of people's hearts right when we talk about the freeness of our community the freeness of our hearts the freeness of blackness so for you and the, the context in the book talk to me about what getting free exactly is Sure. Um, you know, there's personal freedom and then there's collective freedom. Uh, but I, but I want to argue that we can't actually be personally free without the collective being free. Um, not fully, at least. Part of the work of abolition is asking us to free ourselves from the ways in which white supremacy and patriarchy, capitalism, able, ableism, uh, homophobia, transphobia has impacted our lives. And in that freedom truly becomes our ability to live full, healthy, dignified lives. Uh, I think about how often I've interacted with law enforcement, how often I've had to visit loved ones in jails, um, the times I've been arrested for protesting on behalf of Black people's freedom and how unfree I felt, how unsatisfied I felt. And I think especially for black people around the globe, especially those of us who live in Western countries, um, we know so much about unfreedom. And so the work of abolition is about a road towards freedom. It's a journey. And I think obviously a lot about our ancestors who were in literal chattel slavery, who were in chains, who were um, commodity and what they had to do to get themselves physically free and the journey that we're on to really build a free world, uh, a free world, not in the way that the US talks about it, or the UK talks about it, or, you know, Canada talks about it or any other Western country, but I'm talking about a free world in which human beings are able to move uh, through countries without borders, uh, where human beings are free from living under war and terror or constant co colonization. I'm talking about freedom that looks like being able to uh, live full lives without having right-wing media attack us on a daily basis. There is a freedom in which we don't know about yet, but we can fight for and we can uh, push for because it's in that freedom, it's in those freedom dreams 
um, that so many of our ancestors created a pathway for us. And so all I'm doing, all we're doing is creating a pathway for the next generation. Patrice, that's so beautifully said. Um, and I'm thinking about freedom. And you spoke about the, the dreaming of our ancestors. And there's a dreaming that we do collectively in this day and age. And if we move from dreams into conscious and current thought, what do you think needs to change in our thinking to move towards collective and individual freedom? You know, I forget, I think maybe it's chapter eight, maybe the chapter on imagination. <laughs> um, that is, you know, imagination. I, the, the whole reason why I chose to pick a chapter, you know, focus on imagination is because that's the first place that um, white supremacy, patriarchy, colonization, capitalism, that's the first place it steals our ability to imagine something different. It steals our imagination, it makes us believe that the world we're currently live it, living in is the world that's always been. And it makes us believe that if we try to choose something different, say getting rid of the police, getting rid of jails, um, that we are going to be doomed, that it's gonna be a purge. And so, you know, I always like imagine, like if we didn't have the police and, and prisons and jails and court systems, you know, what would happen? What would happen to us? And, you know, Truly, what would happen for Black people is we would be living, we'd be able to jog without being worried about getting shot. We'd be able to sleep in our beds, full night's sleep. We'd be able to go grocery shopping and not worrying about someone trying to, you know, tell us that we were trying to rob the grocery store. I don't know if you all just saw that Ryan Coogler, you know, famous effing director of Black Panther was... Um, called 911 was called on him after he was trying to take money out of his own bank account and the police were called because they said that he was they thought the teller thought he was a bank robber if the police were not in our lives our existence would be so much fuller and so no it would not be the purge and so our job is to imagine something different imagine a new world for us right now but also for our future um, and to imagine a world where there are more possibilities. The current world that we live in is limited. It is deeply limited. It's limited by the legal structure. It's limited by the court systems. It's limited by the police state. So the world that we're imagining is something bigger and freer. He must have been a very calm bank robber as well, you know, like. <laughs> um, so you've touched on something there. And I'm just, I'm scared that someone's going to run in and call us snowflakes. But I'm going to ask you anyway. Marxist snowflakes. Um, but you spoke about defunding the police, right? And it's such a, it's such a tenuous subject. And it's something that people run to whenever someone speaks about abolition. And I think they really misrepresent the conversation. So I'm so happy to be able to have that with you today. And it's central to a lot of your ideology. So can you talk to me about what defunding the police is and what it looks like. Sure. Um, and I want to say that the amazing work of the police, and I say that with all honesty, they are the biggest, most powerful like PR machine. You know, we had 20 million people in the streets in 2020 and folks were all for defunding the police. And in the in true police fashion, they were able to, you know, take that conversation and then use it and now use different harm and violence that happens, you know, across the world to talk about why the defund police movement is dumb and, you know, not right. And, um, and so we also should be recognizing like, how did we go two years later, not even from like everybody saying defund the police to now the police machine, the police PR machine being able to say, actually that was wrong. And, you know, we have, in our country, the president's yelling, screaming for the funding of the police. That is all a part of a PR, PR coordinated um, campaign to because we were winning, because we were being effective in that. So it's our job to stay strong and it's our job to be make defund and abolition more irresistible, more exciting, more palatable. So the defund the police movement is truly a movement that is about getting rid of the ways in which law enforcement is um, 
used at every single given opportunity in our society, whether that's uh, being used as mental health providers, in quotes, um, you know, domestic violence uh, crisis managers, in quotes, dealing with the homeless, you know, um, there are so many ways that law enforcement is used that is actually unacceptable. And we can divert those dollars into real places like mental health services and, you know, domestic violence services and housing services. And so the defund the police movement is a divestment movement. We're asking to divest out of policing, uh, divest out of militarized policing and invest into um, social good, invest into social services. Did you see that our head of police stepped down recently after a racism and misogyny controversy? The same woman that said that institutional racism didn't exist, you know? <laughs> Can you... <laughs> I just thought I'd have a little That's laugh with you there because, you know, we're feeling it inside the room today. And I'm just wondering, like, when you look at that, when you saw that coming out of the UK, what did you think? And given all that you've said, um, why do you think people in the UK are so fearful of the conversation? You know, I've been coming to the UK now to talk about the work of anti-blackness, uh, the work of, you know, challenging law, law enforcement since 2015. And I will say that y'all's media is some of the most whitest, some of the most um, conservative, and also um, some of the most like amnesia media. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've sat with white media anchors who off, you know, offline would say to me, isn't it ridiculous how, you know, black folks in the UK think it's as bad as America? And I would say, well, actually, no, you know, I've seen y'all's deaths in custody and I've seen how, you know, black folks are treated in the immigration system here. I've seen the stop and frisk that happens in your country. I've seen how young black people are treated and they're sort of like jaw dropped. And I think that what's been really powerful about having a global movement that challenges anti-black racism is that each government in each country can no longer deny the ways in which anti-Black racism plays out inside of their country. And while the UK wants to pretend, you know, the UK white folks want to pretend to be the nice white people, they want to pretend to be the white people that aren't doing the terrible things that Black, that white people in America are doing. Yeah, your white people might not be as off the chain as our white people, but they're still privileged. <laughs> they're still, uh, they're still, real privilege and will, real white racism that happens inside of the UK. And so I think that, you know, when my, one of my first trips, I remember people asking like, how is this movement happening in the States? Like, you know, is there any way we can model stuff? And, you know, one of the things I said is like, we have to be bold and courageous. We have to be, we have to be willing to shut shit down. We have to be willing to call out the racism as it's happening in real time. We have to be willing to have courageous conversations in public, in private, and challenge the ways in which, you know, the U.S. becomes sort of the marker. Well, if we're not doing what the U.S. is doing, then we're not terrible and we're not racist. But that is, first of all, the U.S. is the worst example. So, like, that is just not, like, you shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be comparing um, the U.S. to other Western countries. Like, the reality is most of the West is racist and we have to deal with the ways in which racism is embedded inside of the culture, inside of the institutions. And we have to be unafraid to challenge it and show up for it and change it. I love, I love that you touched on that and just like the, the global moving of thought rather than the comparison of this person has it worse or these people have it worse. I remember when the Say Their Name hashtag came out and I saw uh, um, like a thread from Brazil and it was black people who had been killed by the police and all those people were under the age of 16. The youngest one was like six That's years right. old. So it's like yes. when we get into this, you've got it worse and we've got it worse. The conversation's never collective. We don't go anywhere because we're just fighting each other rather than fighting the system that attempts to oppress us and does a very good job of it That's quite exactly often. Right. Um, <laughs> you have multiple themes inside your book. 
Um, and I'm really keen to explore with you, and we're going to do questions and answers in about 10 minutes, um, around identity, right? And I don't mean to sound like one of those Twitter people, because people say, sort of, I'm a Twitter person. But, you know, black people aren't a monolith. You know, people like to say that. But there's a real truth in that, right? There are varying identities that we navigate at one time. And um, you write about sexuality and gender. You write about queerness. You write about trans identity in your book. Um, and I'm just wondering the part they play in this discussion and this moving forwards. Because we spoke about fighting and maybe fighting amongst ourselves. And I just wanted you to dive in to that theme a little bit more and flesh it out for me. Absolutely. I mean, you know, part of the work of, of Black people is to do our work inside of our own home, which is to, you know, challenge the ways in which we are patriarchal, sexist, homophobic, transphobic. Um, and we all witnessed the, the Dave Chappelle debacle, right? And like, at, at the heart of what was happening, <clears throat> I believe for for you know our our community, the queer and trans community was like, hey, you know there has been so much uh, vitriol inside our own communities, inside our own home. Like, how do we actually show up for each other? How do we create an environment where we are we are truly holding each other's differences, not as these things to um, shit on, but our differences as a way to be in better relationship and connection with? And I think, you know the work that we've done over the last, you know, decades specifically to call out transphobia specifically in our community, I think is critical. And we have to keep doing that work. Uh, I think a lot about, I just posted today about, you know, what's happening stateside inside of um, Florida and inside of Texas where they're passing all these anti-trans, anti-gay bills you know, in real time. And, and I grew up in a time where that, you know, there wasn't gay marriage. And I grew up in a time when sodomy laws still existed. And I grew up in a time where I was being harassed on buses as I held my girlfriend's hand and harassed in parks as I, you know, um, kissed my girlfriend and like all the ways in which I, I believed we'd done so much work to create a, a healthy, happier, safer world for our folks. And in the middle of a right-wing bat backlash, not just here in the States, it's a global right-wing backlash that we're witnessing. And that's when they, you know, that's when folks start to go after the folks at the margins. And it's our work to undo the ways in which we believe in some of that right-wing shit to, you know, say, actually, that's not us. That's actually white supremacy. You know, queerness and transness, that is not a product of white supremacy. It's actually anti- queerness, anti-transness, that is a product of white supremacy. We didn't, t we didn't do the sexuality or gender conversation until whiteness and Christianness came over. And so it's really important that we know our history and that we differentiate the ways in which we are being pulled apart on purpose. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a further question, actually, um, because I'm really interested in that. Yeah, you're not getting away that easy. Um, I would like to hear about activism through the lens of a queer woman. Um, I think you, you can't go into this work when it comes to abolition, when it comes to activism, without bringing your whole self, right? You bring your mind, you bring your heart, and you bring your spirit. Um, and I'm really interested in you and how your heart is doing and Patrice as a person, not as this entity that people like to pin things on. And I think this happens quite a lot. Yeah. So give me your heart for a second. Um, and I just want to ask you what activism is like through the lens of a black queer woman. It's a beautiful question. Um, so it's both being incredibly visible and also incredibly invisible. It's knowing that if I were, you know, a, a black man, straight black man, that my work would probably be seen really differently, um, that I would be fought for differently. Um, so much of the visibility that I have has everything to do with me fighting for it and other black women fighting for me to have it um, versus, you know, 
it often being handed to black straight cis men. Like, um, and, you know, I think there's also a lot of creativity in being a black queer woman activist and artist. You know, my work has always been at the intersection of art and activism. And I feel like that has so much to do with, you know, I was always sort of like a weird black girl and never had any um, issues with that. I just was like, this is who I am. This is what we got. And I think that's how I led in my organizing as well. You know, um, we're sort of the first generations of black women being seen with tattoos and, you know, 50 million different hairstyles and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and like a deep kind of creativity um, that we haven't shunned away from. Uh, and that I feel like has a lot to do with the intersection of my blackness and my queerness. Um, you know, I share a really powerful identity with people like Audre Lorde and Angela Davis and James Baldwin. And those are not just some of my fav favorites, but those are some of our favorites. Those are some of our collective favorites. And, you know, I believe that their queerness um, at the intersection of their blackness is what made them really special and what made them really powerful um, orators and what has and what made their writing so powerful um, and why they often led with such vulnerability because even though you know in in my vulnerability <clears throat> there have been times where I've been shot down it's also in my vulnerability where I've found a significant amount of power I can only be who I am can't, I can't be anybody else. I can't be anything else. And when I re realize that, and when I recognize that, it, it provides more safety for me, more power for me. And I think, you know, as I am existing as who I am, I, I speak to so many young Black queer women, young Black women who are just grateful, grateful to have, you know, representation that shows them that they don't have to you know, change their hair, they don't have to change their skin, they don't have to change their size because they see other people existing exactly as who they are. I keep, I'm going to keep saying amen, you know, because you're very much <laughs> touching on everything right now. Um, and another thing that I love that you've touched on is being, you know, people say, bring your full self to work, diversity and inclusion. But actually, you know that for, this is who I am here and I'm going to come to where I am with this and you're going to have to take it. Um, I think it's so important because what really stood out to me around your book was abolition isn't just about those policing systems and those governing systems in society, those official statutory organizations, but it's the things that cage us as free birds. It's how we conform to white supremacy. It's how we keep our hair a particular way, speak in a particular way, bring certain you know, parts of ourselves and leave certain parts behind. Um, and I think a lot of people are gonna pick up your book and think, yeah, this makes sense to me, I wanna go out there. And you've touched on some really difficult points. And there are probably gonna be people in this room right now and people watching at home wanting to know this. And when your heart's heavy, when you've done a lot and maybe it isn't in the right space and you are judged on some of the things that you mentioned, how do you keep going on? How do you keep pushing forward? How do you maintain that momentum? Um, in many ways, one of which is having an active therapist. I'm a big fan of therapy. Um, and I know that, you know, especially for black folks, especially for first generation, you know, black immigrants, that's not always what we were raised with, but it has like transformed my life. And I'm, you know, big, big mental health advocate and, and really push our community to um, tend to our mental health. You know, it's very important. Um, but also I love my people and I love my community and I love my family and I like to spend a lot of time with them. And I like to um, hold space for us and, um, and hold space for myself. Like being in community is really important for me um, and being with other people um, that I love and trust and that see me and I see them is deeply important to me. And then the last thing is I'm a mom and many people don't know that I, I don't post my child on social. So people don't know, you know, I don't actively have that in the conversation, but like being a mother has really been a profound gift. Um, and that is not to say that it, that is the truth for all women, but for me it is. Um, it's been a profound gift to be a mother. And I'm so grateful for my child who is really one of the most hilarious people that I know. And, giving and generous and inquisitive and that it just it just it's so grounding for me 
That's so beautiful, Patrice. Thank you for sharing that with us because um, I know that's really personal for you. I I'm going to bring a final question because we've got four minutes to questions and answers, so I hope you're cooking up. Um, but um, I guess, you know, one of my final questions is, you know, on this road, sometimes we start out with people next to us, right, who we think are our friends or comrades, and the resistance starts and the contention starts or maybe we get it wrong or maybe they get it wrong and fall down. How do you deal with forgiveness on the road to abolition? Because I think people are very absolute. You're either this or you're this. And if you're this, then you're going to be that forever. Can you talk to me about how forgiveness played a part in your journey? Man, I'm still working that, that step. Um, that was the hardest chapter for me to write um, because I felt like, do I really believe in this? <laughs> But I do, I believe in forgiveness, not from the sort of turn the other cheek forgiveness or, you know, don't feel my feelings and, and only focus on the other for forgiveness. But I, what I realize, especially in this work, this work is hard and it's, it's a grind and it's, it can be really painful. What I realize is that forgiving people is also forgiving me. Um, I can, um, I can't continue to do the work if I'm not forgiving myself for the mistakes I've made, the harm I've caused. Um, and if other people are doing those things and I'm not forgiving them, I'm also holding on to something about myself. And so forgiveness really becomes something that's, yes, about the other person, but it's also about my own leadership and my own um, healing. Thank you. And my final question before I jump into the q and A. I mean, people want to bring everyone on this journey, right? And I feel like we speak to people in different ways. Children have different challenges. So young people have different challenges. And the elders, I mean, all they've had to put up with have definitely had some challenges as well. So can you talk to me how you bring young people on this journey with you and how you bring elder people on this journey with you as well? And is the language different? You know, um, I think the way you bring young people on this journey is you're honest with them. Um, when I was a young person and being trained as a community organizer, the best way in my, the, the, the thing that I cherished most in my training was when other, you know, older organizers were being honest with me about what they saw, what they see of the investment that they gave in me. I was deeply invested. I was deeply poured into, and it really mattered as a young person, especially when you grow up black and poor and you're deeply neglected by the state you're neglected by institutions, you're neglected by teachers often and, you know, healthcare systems. And when someone comes to you and is like, I want to train you to help you take back what was taken from you, there, that goes a long way. And so, you know, we don't have the same set of training systems because social media has taken over so much of our social systems. But I really do think I value meeting with young people, talking to them. It's like the best time for me when I'm able to train young folks and also build reciprocal relationships. I'm friends and family with most of the young people I mentored um, as I grew up as a young person mentoring other young people. Um, and I see the work that they're doing and I know that the work that they're doing has a lot to do with what I poured into them. And um, so I'm very, you know, I think part of our work as adults now is to pour into a new generation um, and, and help them and support them in their evolution. Thank you, Patrice. If you bear with me one second, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody watching from home as we're about to dive into the Q&A. So for everyone who joined us today at home, thank you for joining and goodbye. <laughs> but not you.